Foundation. And we're really delighted to have uh, more than 700 people signed up for this meeting, which really uh, is an indication of interest in this topic. And that is advancing human rights in family planning, the agenda for the next decade. So we're delighted to have all of you helping. We're, we're all figuring out this together. So uh, our objectives today, we have an, a, a, an um, ambitious, I think an ambitious agenda and our objectives really are to highlight what changes have taken place since 2019. Boy, that seems like a, a, a lifetime ago at this point, doesn't it? Um, and it was also the time when we celebrated the ICPD at 25 in Nairobi and the challenges and opportunities uh, for human rights um, that have resulted from these challenges, not, uh, of course, not to mention COVID um, at the country level. And we also want to talk about successful strategies and approaches and tools for addressing challenges to human rights-based family planning at the country level, um, and to prepare uh, the foundation for what we hope will be a, an in-person satellite session on rights-based family planning in Thailand in the 2022 ICFP, which is a follow-on to a very successful um, similar satellite session held in, in Kigali in, in 2018. So this is really to keep the momentum going forward. Could I have the next slide, please? So over the next 90 minutes, um, we will have a welcoming and stage setting from leaders in our field. We'll have a discussion with regional and country colleagues about gaining commitment to programmatic actions. And then we'll finally review practical tools uh, to integrate uh, rights into family planning practice. And finally, a wrap up from FP 2030. So I'd like to turn the program over to my colleague, Ben Light, the policy advisor in the contraceptive security branch at UNFPA, who will moderate our first session. Ben, over to you. Thank you so much. Karen, it's really a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ben Light from UNFPA, as Karen mentioned, and I'll be moderating this opening session on stage setting with leaders uh, from the FP community. One quick point of order. Uh, regrettably, uh, Julita, Dr. Julita Onabanjo from UNFPA is unable to join this, this session today. And in her stead, Dr. Gifty Adeko will make remarks on behalf of UNFPA. The first, um, the first question, the first issue that we are inviting the panelists to comment on um, is, is to, to, to set the stage. What are the issues in family planning? Um, and first of all, I to, to set the stage briefly, highlighting how human rights are positioned in each organization's strategies and programs. First of all, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Samuel Kelly Dube, Executive Director of FP2030. Dr. Dube, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much uh, there, Ben, uh, for the introductions. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the introductions. And I'll just opening remarks here. I am so glad and grateful that uh, the world over knows and understands the importance of placing uh, you know, rights in our approach uh, around family planning. I think that is really commendable because whilst we are pushing uh, numbers on one hand and making sure that it's access and quality on the other, fundamentally you know, giving women tools that they can use to protect themselves from uh, you know, unwanted pregnancy pregnancies, et cetera. That is an important rights-based uh, initiative. And I think, Ben, as I welcome everybody today, being glad to co-host this meeting with everybody else on board, we are grateful that the world is taking this seriously because family planning, after all, is a rights-based issue. Thank you so much, Ben, for the introductions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Samuel. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Gifty Adeko. Um, Gifty, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ben, and good 
morning, good afternoon, good evening to colleagues gathered on the call. I want to thank FP2030, USAID, Gates Foundation and Works Association for their close partnership, including on this event that aims to foster discussion of challenges to right-based family planning and to identify solution and solutions and approaches to drive progress. At the heart of UNFPA's mandate is our global role in ensuring girls and women's right to bodily autonomy, integrity, and choice. Whilst a woman's right to make her own choices on sexual and reproductive health has been recognized in many international and regional human rights treaties, her right to make her own choices is far from being fulfilled. We know from data that UNFPA has gathered from 57 countries on SDG target 5.6.1, that half, only half, I mean half of women in reproductive age do not make their own decisions. So only half are able to make their own decisions regarding sexual relations, contraceptive use and healthcare. And these decisions are either made for her by her husband or family, or she's not informed that she has a choice. We also know from data gathered for SDG 5.6.2 that one in five of countries have laws that restrict women's access to contraception and require her to get the consent of her husband, parents, or another third party to access contraceptive services. And too often in this situation where individual rights are violated because of low quality of care, lack of access, lack of information and choice, or disrespectful and abusive behavior, there are very few mechanisms by which to bring attention to those violations and seek redress. And in UNFPA, therefore, we are working to address these gaps by three things. Supporting capacities of national human rights mechanisms to monitor violations on sexual and reproductive health and rights and holding states accountable. We are also strategically engaging with the UN human rights mechanisms, such as the Universal Periodic Review and Treaty Bodies, to position and support implementation of recommendations to the countries, including the area of family planning. And we are supporting civil society and human rights defenders, including in particular women's movements, working to build and sustain support for women's sexual and reproductive health and rights. We all know that when women and girls have access to family planning, they are more likely to stay in school, join the workforce, be able to participate in their communities and fulfill their rights. For UNFPA, our new strategic plan for 2022 to 2025 is directed towards supporting women's bodily autonomy and is solidly anchored in, human, in a human rights-based approach. And for us, a human rights-based approach is one of the critical accelerators that will drive our collective efforts towards these results. At country and global level, UNFP is committed to ensuring family planning is prioritized, to ensure that individuals everywhere can make informed choices about whether, when, and how often to have children. Thank you so much for your attention and we look forward to the discussion. Gifty, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to return the floor to, to Dr. Samuel for some additional opening remarks. Dr. Samuel, please, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I was just, uh, you know, intently greeting and make, making sure that we greet everybody who is here today. Uh, and I'm glad that my colleague here, Gifty, you've just highlighted the importance of placing, uh, you know, rights firmly in the family planning uh, and even the SRHR agenda. I think this, uh, the theme that we are having today, Ben, that, uh, you know, has been highlighted is about how we advance human rights in this agenda for the next decade as we are moving towards 2030. And I think given there is agreement that rights in family planning are important, the conversation ought to focus on what we can do as a collective to improve, particularly the integration of rights into programming as we go forward. And uh, given, and even despite all the political, social and healthcare challenges that we have seen in the past uh, two years. I think also this meeting, as we have said, will lead to 
we, or will culminate to what we are going to discuss later this year in November, where there would be more in-depth conversations, I believe, where partners would engage in implementation so that we can share experiences around how to program, how to measure interventions around rights, and then we can learn from each other. I, I believe that later on we can then discuss fully about how human rights are positioned into our particular programs and that what has happened since uh, 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 2012 and in the past two years within FP 2030 and what we intend to do as an organization. Uh, and as part of our, our commitment uh, toolkit that we have been sending maybe to partners, especially in the comprehensive human rights uh, based voluntary family planning program framework there are some essential elements that I believe will help us ourselves and our partners in programming what is necessary at various levels of the healthcare system. So Ben and uh, all ladies and gentlemen in this room, I believe that we've gone through a lot for us to understand where human rights are squarely placed in the programming. And if we ignore that, not only do we start to retrogress as a movement, but we prevent ourselves from accelerating at the rate that we want in the future, in the, fu in the future of family planning and in the future of the collective of what we are trying to achieve. I'm going to elaborate more, uh, 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 Ben, as we go through the meeting. So thank you very much. Again, indeed, I want to welcome all the guests uh, uh, and everybody else involved. But lastly, maybe before I just leave the floor, I think we have been, we have been seeing support, great support that is that comes from uh, uh, the UNFPA in this partnership. We are grateful for the support that is coming coming from USAID in this partnership, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, some of the academic institutions, the rights uh, uh, organizations that have been, you know, plowing their brain power resources and all hands on deck to make sure that we program correctly, we measure correctly, we implement correctly, and that this movement indeed will achieve what we ought to achieve in the near future. Thank you very much, Ben. Samu, thank you very much for your, your inspiring words and then great energy. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to Ellen Starbird, Ellen Starbird, Director of the Office of Population and Reproductive Health at USAID. Ellen, please, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Ben. <clears throat> at the heart of rights-based family planning is an individual with hopes and dreams and challenges and obstacles in their life with rights, including whether, when, and how many children to have, whether to use contraception, and what method to use. Each of us is that individual. No matter how we self-identify, no matter where we live, how we love, whether we live with a disability. And where there are rights holders, there are also duty bearers with responsibilities to promote, protect, and fulfill those rights. The institutions that support and implement family planning programs are duty bearers for rights-based family planning. At USAID, we have embodied our commitment to rights-based family planning in the principles of, of volunteerism and informed choice. And these two principles have underpinned our work for decades and are just as important today. As the largest bilateral donor of family planning assistance, and a central partner in both FP 2030 and the Ouagadougou Partnership, USAID is committed to supporting countries in ensuring accessibility, acceptability, affordability, and quality in their family planning programming. All are cornerstones of voluntary rights-based family planning programs. So what does our support for client-focused and rights-based family planning look like? It's about choice, and self-determination. We invest in new and improved contraceptive methods with a focus on ones that are affordable and feasible to use in low resource settings so that individuals have a range of contraceptive methods to choose from and can find one that best suits their reproductive intentions at different points in their lives. We improve delivery, affordability, and quality of family planning services at drug shops and pharmacies so clients have more choices where to go for services. We harness innovation in data analytics and technology like the global family planning van to improve visibility all along the supply chain 
so that individuals will be more likely to find the method they want on the shelf where and when they want it. We're also investing in self-care and digital solutions so that a visit to a health pro provider may not even be necessary. We're putting more attention on adolescent focused services and programming that's responsive to the needs of young people, building provider capacity and comfort level to provide to improve the quality of provider client interactions and reduce provider bias and engaging young people themselves in program design, implementation and evaluation. But individuals don't make choices in a vacuum. Our choices are influenced by others' expectations of us, by social and gender norms, by the institutions we interact with. So we support social and behavior change approaches to address gender and social norms that often hinder access to sexual and reproductive health services, information and commodities, or condone harmful behaviors. Institutions play a role too in rights-based family planning. We invest in advocacy to change national and subnational policies that restrict access and to increase funding. Of course, there's much more we all need to do to fully realize rights-based family planning. We still need additional measures of success beyond contraceptive prevalence, better measures of quality, a better understanding of reproductive intentions, and more appreciation for an implementation of integrated approaches. We need to keep working on how to have conversations about family planning, rights-based family planning, how those conversations and family planning can play a role in adaptation to climate change, in building resilience in advance of the next pandemic, in helping to achieve all the SDGs. The 1994 International Conference on Population and Development put the client squarely at the center replacing a top-down demographic approach with a bottom-up rights-centric approach. The founding of the Ouagadougou Partnership in 2011, and then the 2012 London Summit on Family Planning, leading to the creation of FP 2020, refocused attention on family planning. And FP 2020 established a set of rights and empowerment principles. And some of the people who worked on, that, on those are uh, the, um, the organizers of today's webinar established this set of principles to guide its work, and those principles brought clarity to what it means to implement and operationalize rights-based family planning. Those principles continue to ground the work today and are evident in Family Planning 2030's vision, mandate, and ambition. At USAID, we remain committed to ensuring that our assistance is client-centered and supports rights-based family planning and reproductive health programs, that deliver affordable, accessible, acceptable, and high quality information and services for everyone. Thank you. Ellen, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in the next, uh, the next part of, of this op opening session, we are going to hear a, a video. But before we, we get to the video, I'd just like to acknowledge all the partners from across the world who've made the effort to join this this meeting and I'd just like to stress the importance of these issues and I think that the importance of the issues are further underlined by the fact that Natalia Kanem, the executive director of UNFPA has also joined joined the meeting so Natalia it's 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 wonderful to know that that you've joined this this call um, without further ado I will turn the floor Emma, if we can load the video with the remarks of Anne Stars, Director of Family Planning at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is by video. Please, if we can start the video. Thank you. Emma, just flagging that I don't think we can hear the video quite yeah, well. Yeah, there's a problem with the sound at the moment. Yeah, we cannot hear. Um, Emma, perhaps we can. Hello, everyone. 
for those I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Anne Stars, and I'm the Director of Family Planning at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. While I'm not able to participate live in today's discussion with Dr. Dubé and Dr. Onabanjo, I'm honored that our close partners, FP2030 and UNFPA, have asked me to help kick off today's discussion on rights-based family planning. These community discussions are vital for framing and advancing global family planning priorities, from the first ICBD in 1994 to the London Family Planning Summits in 2012 and 2017, which helped shape the framework for voluntary rights-based family planning. This year, we're looking towards ICFP in November, the first major family planning conference since COVID-19 began, to help frame the next chapter. Given the COVID pandemic and the current state of the world, today's conversation is more critical than ever. Partners everywhere have been nimble and innovative as they figured out ways to keep advancing our shared mission of ensuring all people have access to contraception and that women and young people are able to make informed decisions about their health and futures. As we all know, taking a rights-based approach to family planning is about much more than getting contraceptive products out there. It's about ensuring women and young people know the options available to them and have the knowledge, counseling, and support to make a decision or an informed choice about what option is best for them. It's about he how people are treated at the clinic or pharmacy, whether they are listened to and spoken to with respect, free of bias and judgment, regardless of their age, race, gender identity, and marital or socioeconomic status. It's about having a range of high quality contraceptive products in stock and in R&D pipelines so that individuals can choose a method that meets their needs and preferences. It's about whether there is a clinic or other source of contraceptive methods and services that is accessible and affordable in the first place. And finally, it's about whether laws and policies recognize and respect the rights of individuals to make and exercise informed decisions about their fertility and the family planning methods or products they prefer. At the Gates Foundation, we believe our best work is guided by those we serve. As you've probably heard Melinda French Gates say, we must listen to women and young people when they talk to us about what they want and need. Our family planning strategy is centered around this very concept, on meeting women's and young people's needs, preferences, and aspirations. It's also driven by our belief that achieving a more equal world starts with ensuring that women and girls in particular have autonomy over their health, bodies, and futures. That's why one important pillar of our strategy is developing new contraceptive options, since many of today's methods don't meet the needs of women and girls. Nearly 40% of women who begin using family planning discontinue use within a, a year because of concerns about their method. Based on what we've learned about women's and girls' preferences, we're investing in a range of innovative products that put care directly in their hands and empower them to take charge of their own health on their own time. Products such, such as self-injection, a once a month oral contraceptive pill and microarray patches. These and other methods in development are designed to be self-administered at home and in privacy, even more important in the context of the pandemic. Even if we had all of the right products today, there are still many roadblocks to overcome. Our strategy is testing new approaches to bring people the information, services, and contraceptive products they need to manage their own health when, where, and how they want. For example, the data tell us that many women, and especially young people, prefer to get their methods from pharmacies and drug shops, which are more convenient and offer more privacy than public clinics. However, in many places where the foundation works, access isn't the only challenge. Women, girls, and gender non-conforming people face cultural barriers and norms that prevent them from making their own decisions about family planning. The foundation's newly approved gender strategy is helping us apply a gender lens to all of our work so we can understand and address gender-related barriers that undermine access to contraception. For example, we're exploring using peer role models and influencers on digital platforms to reach adolescents and young people in Africa, aiming to break down harmful gender and social norms, myths and misconceptions 
that lead to unhealthy SRH practices. Our work to advance gender equality is inextricably linked to our family planning work, as we emphasize regularly to policymakers. We know that when women and girls have access to contraceptives, they're more likely to pursue an education, enter the workforce, and lift themselves and their families out of poverty. Family planning doesn't just impact women and girls. It leads to healthier communities, healthier economies, and more equitable futures for everyone. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. Well, on, on all of our behalf, uh, thanks to, to Anne um, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for those, those inspiring words. In the, the latter part of this opening session, there's a follow-up question, and uh, I will be asking each of the, the panelists, what changes, political, social, um, in the realm of health, have taken place since 2019 that have affected human rights in the context of family planning. And first of all, I would like uh, Dr. Dr. Samuel to uh, share her thoughts. Dr. Samuel, please, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ben, uh, for those uh, and uh, to uh, my colleagues, uh, Anne, Ellen, and Gifty. Thank you so much for those uh, 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 enduring remarks. I think the question around what has happened in the past, uh, you know, in the past few years around the social and me, you know, political and maybe even health uh, uh, in the health space that could affect rights. We all are uh, tempted perhaps to start off with the, the, the re recent past or the recent future and present, which is COVID-19. I think COVID-19, as you know, Ben, has highlighted some of the inequities that we see, whether it's gender inequalities, it has actually brought them to the fore, whether it's supply chain issues and cracks, it has really brought that to the fore. And I'm sure we, for me, the conversation around COVID-19 ought to, ought to be looking closer and deeper at the numbers and what they mean overall, number one, but also learning what we can do better in programming for family planning. I think those are important issues that we ought to look at. But when you also trace in many of the countries where we live, for example, we were discussing yesterday the, 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 the issue of political unrest uh, and we're seeing many countries emerging or currently are particularly in Africa and elsewhere where we are seeing uh, countries living under coup d'etat. So political unrest and conflict seem to be, you know, consistent and persistent across the world, Ben. And there is need for us to program better for human rights in a humanitarian setting. And because these are emerging, how do we deal with these issues? And uh, compounded by that is the, uh, the issues that are obviously evident around climate change, obviously compounding the issues of humanitarian crisis that we are seeing across. From where I see it, I am seeing again a challenge that is around funding uh, and funding cuts that we know we are seeing globally for SRHR in general and for family planning issues also in particular. And we are aware that if, if this is not addressed somewhat, whether we're talking about uh, uh, you know, donor engagement in that space, or we're talking about domestic financing, or we are talking about how we could intently program, you know, uh, family planning uh, and, and sexual health and reproductive rights within UHC agendas or even within other financing agendas, we are not going to meet the marks. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now and allow my colleagues to, to get uh, 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 some remarks. Thanks, Ben. Dr. Samuel, thank you very much. Um, I'd like now like to, to hand the floor to Gifty again. The question is, what changes have taken place since 2019 that have affected human rights in the context of family planning? Gifty, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Dr. Samuel and other panelists. <clears throat> so we know that as the world enters the final decade of the Sustainable Development Goals, <clears throat> excuse me, we are being confronted by multiple and intersecting crises that disproportionately affect women and girls. And these changes have become very obvious. As Samuel just alluded to, 
climate change, economic inequalities, persistent civil and international conflicts, famine, and disease outbreaks, including COVID, are taking place against the backdrop of rising violence and pushback against human rights. And these challenges call for all of us to elevate rights more centrally within our mandate and to boost investments in our human rights work. The United Nations Secretary General in 2020 therefore issued a call to action for human rights that seeks to reaffirm the United Nations commitment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and underlines that human rights are the responsibility of each and every United Nations actor and that a culture of human rights must permeate everything we do in the field at regional level and at um, global levels also. At UNFPA, we recognize that gender equality, human rights and social justice are instrumental in overcoming these global complex challenges that we see. And therefore in response, we are actively collaborating with partners, especially local actors and leaders and also with global partners to open pathways for change and to tailor responses to needs in both development and humanitarian settings. And that is crucial for us that it's across development, humanitarian, uh, across that nexus. And we, achieve, we, we believe that achieving universal sexual and reproductive health can only be realized with an increased focus on promoting and protecting the rights and inclusive participation of women, adolescent girls and youth, but especially adolescent girls as agents of change. So accelerated and specific actions across humanitarian and development, development programming are vital. As such, we need to ensure that all family planning programs and services are human rights based and uphold the dignity of all who access them. We must commit to protecting and defending these rights today and every day. Thank you. Gifty, thank you very much. Um, it's now my pleasure to uh, pose the same question to, to Ellen Starbird. What changes have taken place since 2019 that have affected human rights in the context of family planning? Ellen, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ben. Um, sorry, just a second. I'm having a little computer problem here. Um, so I think the principal change that, that everybody probably has recognized is, um, is the change in the U.S. administration. And with the advent of the Biden-Harris administration, we now have an administration that is very committed to, uh, to individual um, rights and empowerment. I'm sorry, I, give me just a second here. I, my computer has... Ellen, we can. Out. Ellen, if you'd like yeah. a minute, we could switch to Anne's second response. Um, I, Emma, I, perhaps. I, I think I'm good. Okay, great. Thank Please. you. Apologies, and thank you very much. <clears throat> so, as I was noting, the Biden administration has brought a shift in the U.S. policy position on rights and upholding reproductive health and rights for all including through access to voluntary family planning and the prevention of gender-based violence, our priorities in US global health and humanitarian assistance. The administration is fully committed to protecting women's and girls' sexual and reproductive health and rights globally, as President Biden has, sing has signaled in a number of ways, including the revocation of the Protecting Life and Global Health Assistance Policy, the restoring of the US contribution to UNFPA, the advent of a national gender strategy um, for, for the US that covers both domestic and international work. And so at USAID, we're working hard to ensure that access to voluntary family planning and reproductive health is recognized as a key component of making this commitment a reality. Um, we're engaged in interagency spaces around this. We are um, more present than we were under the prior administration in multilateral conversations in this space. Uh, and I think it bodes well for continuing to move forward with rights-based family planning in the face of all the kinds of challenges that, that Gifty and others have, have referenced, um, including COVID of course, and um, 
and in humanitarian settings, uh, ensuring that uh, women and girls and, and, and everyone really is in a position to participate in making the world a better place for all of us. I'll stop there, thanks. Ellen, thank you very much. These are clearly challenging times, but, but it, it, it's great to know um, the, the positive uh, elements that are, are, are helping us in, in these efforts. Emma, if it'd be possible to play Anne's response to the second, second issue, please. Thank you. It's hard to imagine any answer other than COVID in response to this question. It has undeniably had a profound impact on human rights and equity. The pandemic has disproportionately affected the world's most vulnerable communities. And within those communities, women and girls have borne the brunt of it. They've had to take on more caretaking responsibilities. They haven't returned to work at the same rate as men. Women's health has been deprioritized as funds are diverted to the COVID-19 response and major global donors have scaled back their support. This has given way to some of the starkest increases in global maternal and newborn deaths in decades. One silver lining to point to over the last two years is how governments and family planning partners have risen to the challenge, innovating and adapting to meet women's and girls changing contraceptive needs. For example, Egypt began dispensing three-month supply of contraceptives, while Benin and Madagascar scaled up self-injectable contraceptives. Beginning in 2022, Ghana will expand its national health insurance scheme and make long-acting contraception free at all primary health centers, removing all out-of-pocket costs. We're continuing to see significant new policies to enable telehealth and digital health, making it easier for people to access family planning services remotely. We hope these trends will continue after the pandemic. It's been heartening to see how policymakers have rallied to support these new entrepreneurial approaches that have helped lessen the impact of COVID's disruptions. I'm hopeful that the pandemic has in fact opened the door for even more innovation moving forward. Well, again, on all of our behalf, uh, thanks to Anne and the Gates Foundation it's hard for, to imagine. for those remarks. It's now my pleasure to, to thank all of the panelists for, for their, their inspiring words and, and insights um, that conclude, and this concludes the, the session, setting the stage. Um, thanks to all of, of the panelists, um, Dr. Dube, Gifty Adiko, Ellen Starbird, and Anne Stars. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to Lynn Bakamjan of What Works Association. Thank you all very much. Lynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ben. Um, before we get to our next panel, let's shift gears a bit. It's so great to see the level of interest in this webinar on rights and family planning, and we wish we could have a conversation with all of you. So we thought it would be fun to hear from you about the kinds of challenges related to rights in your program in real time. So if you are able to, please log on to menti.com and enter the code on the slide um, here and say in one or two words, what is the biggest barrier to rights-based family planning in your program? This will give us an idea again in real time about some of the challenges you are facing so that we can talk about what might be available to address them. So if my colleague can go to the, um, hopefully you're all able to do that and we'll see what emerges um, through a word cloud. Oh, wow. Social norms is amazing. Look at that. Great. Great. 
So it looks like we've got social norms as a huge category, stigma and discrimination, poverty, access, patriarchy, more social norms. Um, great. There are a lot of different issues here, but we can see how many of them, oh wow, many of them have, yes, I think we're, I think we're getting a picture here, mainly about social norms and access and uh, provider bias, but there are so many more issues. Fantastic, um, fantastic. So I think we're going to be hearing more about this. Let's, let's move on. I think we're going to be hearing more about this um, from our next panel. So I'm happy to hand the microphone over to my colleague at What Works Association, Jan Kumar, who will introduce the panelists and get us started in terms of understanding how to address many of these um, issues through practical advocacy. Jan, over to you. Thank you, Lynn. Do we have the other panelists? If you could unmute and show your lovely faces, we'll get started. Good day, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next panel, which will focus on challenges and solutions to advancing human rights in family planning programs at the country or project level. Our specific objective is to share with you concrete examples from partners from different regions regarding how human rights are being integrated into family planning commitments and programs. Due to the limited time, our speakers' contributions will be illustrative, not exhaustive, but we hope that they will be instructive for all of us. We will hear perspectives from the following distinguished panelists. Modibo Maiga, the regional director from the HB Plus West Africa project, uh, and he's based in Palladium. Ramatu Garoda, the Regional Family Planning Advisor from the UNFPA East and Southern Africa Regional Office, and Shovik Pine, Senior Program Officer from the YP Foundation of India, which is an organization that builds the leadership and advocacy capacity of youth. Now, before we get started, I would just like to note that as questions occur to you, we encourage you to post them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and please indicate to whom the question is directed. After we hear from all the panelists, we will reserve a few minutes to respond to as many questions as we can get to. However, we will collect and consider all questions to help inform plans for the next meeting on human rights and family planning that uh, Karen mentioned that will be held in conjunction with the next IFPC. So let's get to it. I'm going to ask a few questions and have each of you respond in turn to each one. We're looking forward to hearing concrete examples from your regional experiences. So the first question is, uh, is the following. What kinds of resistance or challenges have you met within your institutions or partners when promoting a rights-based approach for family planning? And the second part, how have you been able to address or overcome these challenges? And I'm going to ask Modibo to, to begin, uh, and we will hear your responses before asking the same questions of the other two panelists. So Modibo, the floor, floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Jan. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, allow me to thank uh, the, organization, the organizer of this very important uh, webinar. And uh, I would like to thank you, to thank Karen, Sophie, your excellent team. And also to make a, a special mention to our director, uh, Sunita, who is also attending this meeting. And my colleagues, uh, our reproductive health director, Jay Grable, Barbara, Carol, for their suggestion and advice. Thank you also to my health policy colleagues for all the support. And what I would like to say at the beginning is to come with a positive element, uh, to thank uh, all the donors and, uh, you know, I mean USAID, 
UNFPA, Family Planning 2020, Bill and Melinda Gates, the Wagadugu Partnership, for all the effort we are putting together to help those countries moving forward. Things has been changed, even though it's very slow. But uh, we are, you know, we are seeing a very big change in the area of family planning. This, uh, this, I think, is seven or ten years. So we do have uh, resistance and challenges, of course. And the first one they want to highlight is also how to reach the community level, mainly the remote areas and uh, people living in the rural areas. How we can ensure that family planning is there? How we can ensure that all the products are there? And this is a big challenge for uh, our decision makers. And also how to respect and to ensure that the customer choice are there. Sometimes we have limited, limited choices. In many places, mainly in the remote area, you do have sometimes only two methods. And this is against, you know, promoting right-based family planning. Also the resistance to provide services to adolescents and youth in some places, and how to ensure that they will have access because it's true they do have also financial issues, financial access to family planning issue, uh, product. The gender issues, the main opposition, how to ensure that men will be very strong partners in this area, and how to ensure that also people living with disabilities, the rights are promoting, are taking into account. And uh, in some places, we have challenges because the policy started that the family planning is mainly for married women. How about other women? So this is the few challenges. And uh, of course, we have uh, the political will to put more money. And there is this very important component, which is essential, which is key for the development of this region. We are also working uh, in Francophone West Africa with uh, a very conservative place. It's not easy to tackle all the barriers but uh, we do have, uh, as I mentioned, progress this uh, 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 last year. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Modibo. Ramatu, I would like to ask you to address the same question. Could you please highlight the major challenges and the successes, what has worked to get around some of the resistance? Can you please unmute Ramatu? You're muted. Apologies, uh, thank you, Jane, and thank you um, everyone for coming to this webinar. Uh, challenges, uh, resistance within UNFPA, they really, um, I would say UNFPA uh, is the UN agency with the mandate to uphold sexual and reproductive health and rights. So rights-based are permeated within our work and staff understand the principles of equality, non-discrimination, quality accountability in programming. And human rights-based approaches are actually identified as one of the main accelerators in the UNFPA strategic plan uh, to enhance performance and scaling up or speeding up of process towards achievement of the strategic uh, plan results. So we do have multiple uh, pronged uh, initiatives that have been um, within the uh, introduced within the program. Uh, the experience uh, we've had in countries uh, at regional level and as also within um, the region in countries is uh, Insufficient rights literacy among policymakers, management, and even service providers. This hinders full implementation of human rights based approaches to family planning. And of course, misconception and resistance to the word rights, as some of you mentioned, um, because it is perceived as either promotion of abortion, sexuality, LGBT rights, or promiscuity among. Uh, youths as instanced by resistance or uh, 
uh, to CSE. And then again, we have, of course, political resistance, uh, conservative social cultural norms and practices, where girls really have no bodily autonomy, as mentioned earlier by Gifty. All these uh, are, are challenges that uh, are faced. And one aspect is the uh, area of uh, financing or funding. Once something is a right, it will require funding, and governments are looking for ways, of course, to keep the expenditure low, so they might not, you know, prioritize uh, family uh, planning. Um, an analysis of the understanding of rights-based approach to family planning within the region, of course, working with World Works Association, led to the development of a comprehensive voluntary family planning framework, which helped to establish a common understanding of human rights-based family planning across the organization, and also uh, the identification of strengths and gaps uh, using existing, using the, uh, an assessment tool that was developed, also then helped to propose actions to address uh, uh, those gaps. So more explicitly, uh, what we're doing in the region and in country program documents is incorporation of human rights-based uh, approaches in monitoring, evaluation, and accountability uh, uh, processes uh, as well. Uh, thank you, I'll stop here. Over. Thank you, Rama, too. Um, Shovik, we will give you the floor. Could you please address the same question? Yeah, um, hi, everyone, and uh, thanks so much uh, yeah, for uh, giving this opportunity. So, uh, I mean, in uh, consonance with uh, what my fellow panelists have already been uh, saying, so in terms of the challenges we also face, like I would try to say that one uh, overarching layer was definitely the deprioritization of uh, FP services or contraceptive services in the wake of the pandemic. And from a uh, looking from a policy lens also, though um, there are not only official targets there, but still there's an, in the policy framework, there's an approach of an instrumentalist uh, direction, which kind of driven towards uh, certain demographic numbers. And also the programming is very much from a hetero patriarchal uh, framework where the need of contraception is also uh, seen from a very limited and a myopic lens. It also places a woman at a much, much higher burden of the responsibility of uh, contraception. And also coming to a community level, there's definitely a lot of discomfort around accepting that uh, since we also as an organization have a focus of constituencies of adolescents, young people. So there's a lot of uh, stigma and uncomfortability to accept uh, adolescent sexuality, like uh, consider them as sexual beings. And there's obviously because of that, a lot of community backlash. So within these uh, contexts, there were uh, definitely a lot of um, challenges, uh, barriers we face, and also the legal framework of the country, which unfortunately even uh, criminalizes consensual uh, sexual activity under the age of 18. So that's also uh, comes across as a uh, barrier. And also uh, one of the implementation level of uh, certain challenges is also the compartmentalization, how uh, many of the programming happens. To uh, cite an example in the Indian context, though adolescents, uh, there's a specific program on adolescent health uh, that comes under a separate division while uh, the FP or uh, the family planning has a separate division. Though there are guidelines around convergences, those actually do not happen on ground. So that leads to a lot of like uh, breaks in the system, how which um, like the access is also creates a lot of barriers in uh, such kind of a compartmentalized uh, system. So there's a service delivery element to it. There's a supply chain of commodities to it and the community engagement part of it. So often they're not also in sync. So this also leads to a lot of uh, challenges, especially for like um, people or rights holders who are at the margins of the society. So these are definitely some of the uh, challenges we faced. We definitely try to work around um, those through more of engagement with implementers uh, to summon because like making larger policy level changes requires a lot of time. So from a ground level experiences, we uh, used a lot of uh, avenues uh, to engage these uh, stakeholders and try to uh, bring them on the same page and ensure some elements of uh, keeping human rights approaches in the contraception or FP service delivery could be ensured. So yeah, I will. Uh, keep this short and maybe I'll elaborate further. Thank you. Thank you, Shovik. 
Okay, we'll move on to a an, an related question, which is what do you think is the most critical input or action to be taken to ensure that human rights are integrated within family planning programs? And this time, let's start with Ramatu, please. Um, thank you, Jen. Um, actually, prioritization and positioning of um, human rights into family planning, uh, international development plans, into all programming, including in humanitarian situations, whether it's due to conflict, climate change, or other um, emergencies, as mentioned in COVID, is uh, critical. And then allocation of resources, because there needs to be coordination, monitoring of health systems uh, compliance with human rights uh, obligations and uh, engaging uh, other partners, particularly national human rights institutions and bodies like those that are related to CEDA, Convention of Eliminating of All Rights, uh, all forms of discrimination against women and even Convention of the Rights of the Child. Uh, those engagements are paramount. Um, engaging civil society, human rights defenders and movements, youth groups, working to build, and women's groups, you know, uh, working to build and sustain uh, support for uh, women's uh, access, you know, and rights. Uh, family planning is, uh, is uh, important. Uh, within, within programming, it's important to integrate uh, human rights-based approaches of family to existing data, monitoring tools and systems, as this will now ensure the availability of data that will foster um, evidence-based advocacy and, and awareness, you know, of course, capacity building across board, whether it's government, parliamentarians, CSOs, and we cannot uh, minimize the importance of um, research, you know, uh, and dissemination of uh, best practices and South-South uh, uh, cooperation. So uh, these are the, uh, critical inputs uh, to ensure, you know, um, integration uh, into, into programs and, and making uh, rights-based family planning a, a priority in, uh, in, in all uh, government uh, programming. Thank you. Ora. Thank you, Ramatu. Uh, let's see, Shovak, could you respond to the same question? Again, what do you think is the most critical input or action to ensure that human rights will be integrated into family planning programs? Yeah, I think uh, this is a very uh, a challenging question because I guess there is no one magic bullet uh, solution uh, to this. There has to be like a multi-pronged, multi-stakeholder uh, and a multi-sectoral approach actually to address uh, this and center uh, human rights in any kind of uh, interventions. So I think uh, if I have to still pick one, I would uh, say like ensuring from a, a perspective, a user's perspective, a continuum of care approaches uh, in, in the intervention is very much needed so that there is uh, access to uh, rights-based, non-judgmental, comprehensive sexuality education to access to a wide basket of uh, contraceptive choices, which includes emergency contraceptives, as well as knowledge and access to safe abortion services. So if all of this continuum of care is ensured and um, every individual have a uh, knowledge uh, around and uh, clear access to it, then only, I guess, it centers uh, from a human rights uh, perspective and keeping the user at the core of the programming. So I think this is uh, very important from an implementation perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Modibo, we'd like to hear your perspective. What do you think is the most critical input or action? Oh, thank you so much. I think uh, also due to the strong commitment from the international community and all uh, the support we are receiving from uh, USAID Family Planning 2020, Bill and Melinda Gates, and the tools also you developed, I think uh, we use those tools to strongly advocate for taking into account the human rights based family planning into the CIPs. I can confess that uh, the first generation of CIPs didn't uh, uh, write a lot or talk about, uh, you know, human rights based family planning. But the second generation, 
based on all the information we received from uh, Family Planning 2020, the Wagadugu Partnership, USAID, and based also on this very important framework developed by UNFPA, by uh, also the World Health Organization, we are able to convince that it is very important to ensure that it will be in all the CIPs. And now no, all the new CIPs developed in the region have at least three or five pages or six pages dedicated to human rights base. And it's included on all the components. It means the service delivery component, the demand component, the, in a, uh, the policy component. So this is uh, what uh, we are doing. And also we do have in the region now very vibrant uh, adolescent and youth groups who are also advocating for the right to ensure that uh, uh, the right will be also taken into consideration. So now the question is also, we still need a, a very strong political commitment to ensure that uh, this will be also implemented because having all those things is one thing, but ensure that it will be implementing. implementing. For instance, the touch sharing policies to ensure that contraceptive will be everywhere and community health workers can also give not only pills but also injectables and uh, how also to you know scale up not only piloting in two or three districts this is the main challenges we are facing thank you thank you very much i would like to thank the entire panel for helping to illustrate the complexity of of the issue and the fact that human rights cuts through everything that we do. It is not just a service delivery issue. It is imbued at the policy level, the community level, certainly the service delivery level. And there are many actions that we can take to help advance and protect human rights in our family planning programs. So in the few minutes that remain, I would like to entertain some of your questions from the participants and Karen, I'm going to ask you to please um, queue up some of the questions, which I, let's see, I can see. Are there any that you would like to put forward? Yes, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. And uh, maybe I can start with one uh, question that, um, that has come up about sort of the use of contraception for preventing a birth versus for pleasure. And the question is, how can we destigmatize the concept of pleasure as part of, of human rights? So, uh, Shuvik, it was, it was directed to you to begin with. So I don't know if you want to answer or and any of the other panelists. Sure. I mean, I can uh, give uh, my thoughts and uh, definitely would request uh, other panelists to add to uh, this. Uh, I think uh, one is uh, definitely having like a uh, anchor often in uh, many conversations that are uh, to give an example in uh, many communities say child marriage in itself is a big issue they're uh, grappling with uh, the society and uh, other institutions also looking at it so maybe using that as an inroad to have uh, further conversations from it's the causes and uh, more of was the impact of it. And within those conversations, like centering how it's important to have agencies, have like uh, the agency to make the informed decisions, having knowledge about everything, and then slowly uh, get into these uh, conversations. Often community gatekeepers definitely have a fear uh, that having these conversations is lead, lead to some, uh, according to them, uh, not so appropriate uh, behavior. So having like, Again, finding a common ground where that uh, community gatekeeper or stakeholder is interested in engaging definitely uh, adds a lot of uh, support in having further and deeper uh, conversation. So that's in our experience have uh, worked a lot. So yeah, uh, that's one way I would want to suggest. Thank you. Ramatu or, or Modibo, do you have any anything? We have other questions, so you don't have to answer, but uh, if you have anything to add, please do. Um, yeah, just to say that across, you know, uh, different countries, across different programs and communities, you know, depending, again, we have talked about social norms and, and, and beliefs. And so really discussing women's health and we're talking about contraception, uh, STIs even, 
pleasure, masturbation, all those things are considered uh, taboo. And so it's, it's gonna take um, uh, being bold, you know, uh, to really talk about, about uh, these things. And I believe that um, uh, discussing this with some of the uh, CBOs, CSOs, you know, bringing this up in, in community meetings and groups, uh, age-based groups, of course. And then, you know, uh, some of these uh, pleasure-related uh, discussions may be able to happen related to uh, contraception and not just planning of families. Maybe I can go on to another another theme. The theme of um, of our terminology comes is is coming up. Why are we calling it family planning? Why are we not calling it contraception? Maybe we should call it birth control. Um, I'm not sure that uh, we have the time to get into that really important discussion. So I'd like to bring up another topic that keeps that's come up um, in a few of the questions, and that is adolescence, meeting the needs of adolescents. Um, and some of you, you talked about that in your comments. Um, you know, sometimes even married adolescents um, aren't getting the services that, that, that they need. So uh, maybe sort of with a, uh, if we could maybe ask if any of you uh, sort of think that with this focus on rights, you know, um, you know, over the last several years, has there been progress? Is it getting easier for adolescents, either unmarried or married, to access whatever you want to call it, birth control, contraception, family planning? Has it gotten any easier or is it is still really a, a huge challenge? And again, not directed yeah. to any one of the panelists. So I don't know, Modi Bode, maybe if you have any, any an answer. Yes, uh, thank you for this uh, very important question. I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, we, we, we really made a, a very nice progress this uh, five or seven years. I think uh, this, uh, I need to thank everybody for that. So things are moving. So we, we can see that uh, now we also promote uh, a policy dialogue in some places between community leaders and youth. This was not uh, happening, I think, uh, uh, past 20 years, but this is happening now. And uh, little by little, I think uh, many of them, what we call the leaders, are getting the point that uh, they need to hear and to respect also the perspective coming from youth and adolescent. It's not easy in a very, very conservative region like uh, the Francophone West Africa region, but uh, we are moving. And if you see also the increase in the use of uh, modern contraceptive rate, something very special have happened in the region. The progress we are making now is very different from what we, we used to have, I think, uh, the 20 years. I think uh, this is something, but uh, you know, we need to be very careful about uh, the terminology because in some places, even, you know, uh, family planning is not accepted. They will tell you that our national policy is birth spacing, not family planning. So if we come with uh, very strong words, I think uh, it could be very difficult in some very conservative places. We need to advocate to tell them also why we need also to ensure that all people, all couples and individuals, as it has been started 50 years ago in the International Conference on Human Rights uh, in uh, May 1968, and also stressed by the ICPD uh, and uh, all the meeting we had in London, I think uh, we need to ensure that it's a right for people to have access to family planning services. But the way to use the word, coming to leaders, your political decision makers is sometimes very tricky. If you want to go very fast and uh, you know come with our terminology, it could be uh, a, a big problem. We need also to take into consideration the social norms. I saw during the session managed by Lynn that the social norms came as a major issue. This means that we need to consider how we can even customize, you know, uh, you know, the terminology with local names to ensure that people will accept that. Thank you, Karen. 
Thank you. Ramatu or Shovik, do you have any, anything to add? Uh, yes. Uh, for the Eastern Southern Africa region, I would say there has been some improvement, even though the um, unmet need for contraception is really highest among adolescents in our region. They, they have the highest you know, rates of unmet, unmet need. And of course, we also have the highest teenage pregnancy, you know, physically in, in, on the continent. Um, but the, the reality is that um, unmarried adolescents tend to have you know, uh, more issues around accessing contraceptives than married adolescents. And in some instances, even married adolescents, you know, may have uh, uh, issues. Um, in terms of uh, programming, definitely a lot has been done to really uh, target both um, uh, all SRH services, basically, whether it's antenatal care, HIV, you know, um, treatment and integrating uh, those services, and, and there is uh, uh, some improvement, but really there's a lot more uh, to go. And I think part of this reason is why UNFPA has a whole youth output now in its strategic plan, so that we can target, you know, really what are the gaps and um, go on and, and work directly with, uh, with young people so they have a voice around how, uh, you know, we can increase youth uptake, you know, of, of contraceptives. Um, married or unmarried. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jan, I think in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, but there are a lot more uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful questions that give us a lot of food for thought for uh, our, our next session in Thailand. So thanks. Thank you, Karen. And thank you to the participants for sharing your questions, which again, we will be considering. We're sorry that we cannot answer all of them here. And deep thanks to the panelists for sharing your thoughts, your experience, and your insights. So with that, I'm going to turn, it, turn the floor back to Lynn, who will share some resources with you. Thank you, Jan. And thank you to all the panelists so far. This has been such an interesting conversation. So the word cloud, that we saw earlier raised a bunch of barriers to rights-based family planning, such as, and amazingly, such social norms, not that that was a huge surprise, and especially those norms that have to do with gender. In addition, lack of access and acceptable choices came up, lack of data, stigma and discrimination against certain groups, issues related to empowerment and adolescence in particular, and lack of understanding about what does constitute a rights-based approach. All of these were reflected in that word cloud. So what can we do about it? And not just to talk about rights, but to, but to operationalize them and put them into action. So this body of work that I'll share with you to operationalize human rights principles and family planning started about 10 years ago following the London summit in 2012 when it was recognized that greater attention to ensuring rights was a critical component for achieving ambitious numerical goals. And so over the decade with funding from the Gates Foundation, USAID and others, um, these tools grew out of work in Nigeria and Uganda, as well as through consultations with WHO at ICFP meetings with countless global, regional, and national stakeholders. So with the short amount of time left today, I'd like to share a few tools that have been developed to help programs operationalize these human rights principles within family planning programs, and these to address many of these barriers. Next slide, please. So if you've wondered what a human rights-based approach to family planning looks like, this first tool answers that question and provides a definition. Oh, did you do the next slide, please? Yes, thank you. Um, this first tool answers that question and provides a definition in terms that, in terms that makes sense to programmers. In other words, taking rights concepts and translating them into language that resonates with those who design, manage, and implement family planning programs. The Human Rights-Based Voluntary Family Planning Framework, endorsed by FP2030 and UNFPA, 
provides a graphic depiction of the essential elements that should ideally be in place at those levels in the healthcare system, at the policy level, service delivery level, community level, and individual level to ensure a human rights-based family planning program. It draws heavily on human rights related principles and standards that have been defined for contraceptive information and services articulated by WHO in 2015. And it is an important foundational document for the tools that I'll mention next. It's both available in French and English as well. Next slide, please. So the second resource addresses the question, how does a particular family program measure up to the ideal in the framework from a human rights perspective? And what steps can we take to better protect and fulfill individual human rights? This resource is the program assessment tool for a human rights-based approach to voluntary family planning. And it was developed for use by UNFPA country programs. Using the framework from the previous slide, this tool helps to assess a program and plan how to improve it through an eight step process, which is seen on the right hand slide side of the slide. And that includes a three day stakeholder workshop. The assessment helps examine strengths, weaknesses and gaps related to human rights and um, in a particular program and provides the tool provides all necessary materials for the workshop and templates to go through the steps in the assessment and planning process. Next slide, please. The third feature, which is on the left, addresses the question, how can we develop knowledge and skills of family planning providers and other service level stakeholders to deliver human rights-based services? So for this, we introduced the human rights-based family planning voluntary training package based on Palladium in Nigeria and I, based on work done by Palladium in Nigeria and IPPF in Uganda. And this includes five modules to help build capacity of specific human rights duty bearers, national stakeholders and programmers, service providers, supervisors, and facility health committees. It includes a module for action planning to address gaps in service delivery. And each module has a facilitator's guide, training content, and exercises. On the right-hand side is the final and fourth resource that we'd like to share, which answers the question, how can we qualitatively assess how family planning service delivery practices and conditions support rights-based services? This measurement tool is a package of four data collection instruments intended to assess and measure adherence to the agreed rights principles within service delivery programs. If the package includes a facility audit, client exit interview, a simulated client exercise, and provider interviews, and can be used to actually situate a program in terms of how it's doing, whether it's an assessment, evaluation, or just ongoing monitoring. So the final slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so basically these resources will be provided to you via a link in the chat if you want to download them. They're also available on the um, What Works Association website. And we hope, and the FP2030 Rights website, which is now up and running. And we really hope that um, you'll have a chance to take a look at them and use them going forward to inform how you uh, operationalize rights within family planning. And if there are other um, resources that you're aware of that we haven't shared today, please also feel free to put them in the chat as we're looking to amass as many um, tools and, and um, resources as possible to inform this work going forward. So thank you very much. I'd like to turn it over to Monday of FP 2030 to um, wrap up and close. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Hello, everyone. I'm Monday Limbo, Global Initiatives Director at FP2030. So on behalf of FP2030, I'd like to begin by thanking all participants for joining us today. We, we thank you for your active um, engagement. I also want to thank our distinguished speakers, Dr. Samu, uh, Dr. Gifty, and 
Ellen and all the panelists and moderators for their insights and for really fostering a spirit of uh, collaboration and, and partnership. And special thanks to our colleagues at UNFPA and What Works Association for their partnership and leadership and for working so hard to make sure this webinar is successful. So as Dr. Samu mentioned, the rights agenda is a central part of FP 2030's vision. And this conversation is very timely for us as countries are working on their 2030 commitments. We're so pleased to see many countries have included rights language in their commitments, uh, committing to expanding method choice, improving quality, ensuring equity, and, and strengthening accountability. So this is definitely a win, but the work uh, is far from completion as, as a community. There's so much more we need to do to make a rights-based approach to family planning real at the country level. We've heard today from the speakers that we need to strengthen capacity and, and reduce provider bias, um, address gender and social norms that condom uh, harmful behaviors, and find ways to better measure rights um, and quality, among other important actions. So we do hope the country examples and, and resources shared today will help uh, program designers and partners in general to assess their family planning programs, identify gaps, and determine uh, individual community policy programmatic actions that are needed to strengthen programs through a rights lens. We at FP2030 look forward to continuing our collaboration with governments, donors, and all of you to push this agenda forward. We also call on our civil society partners to continue to be strong advocates and use advocacy and accountability approaches to advance rights-based family planning uh, to complement the programmatic efforts. So this is definitely not the end of this conversation. Today is the start um, of the journey towards ICFP in November. As noted by Karen in the beginning, um, we're looking forward to hosting a satellite session at ICFP that will hopefully be a day long event to discuss in more detail um, issues raised today and to follow up on a similar meeting that we held at the last ICFP in Kigali. We welcome your ideas on what the event should uh, focus on. So please type your ideas in the chat box if you have a minute or reach out, out to us um, after the webinar and we'll incorporate your feedback as we design the session. Uh, so with that, let me again thank you very much for your participation. I look forward to seeing you all um, at ICFP or before that. And again, we'll share this meeting's recording in, in due course. So thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, everyone.